Now for the political analysis of Fromm and Fuller. Al Fromm, former political advisor to President Bill Clinton, and Craig Fuller, former political advisor to both President Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Good morning, all, and Happy New Year. Al, uh, as we acknowledge the, the first uh, anniversary of the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol today, I think many Americans are still trying to wrap their heads around the consequences of that painful day, both in terms of motivation and the legal accountability for those who participated, but also the political costs that the Republican Party might face as they remain surprisingly indifferent or downright hostile to the House Select Committee investigating those events. As we look down the road at the more severe disclosures of what happened on that day, and now we know there will be significant public hearings over the next six months, do you think the impact on voters will be similar to those uh, that experience, uh, that we experience in the aftermath of the Watergate hearings and the Nixon resignation, where Republicans paid a very heavy price in the midterm elections in 1974. Well, good morning and uh, happy new year. Uh, the, I, I, I suspect that uh, the ramifications will not be as great, uh, but to be honest with you, I don't think we'll really know until more events uh, unfold later this year. After all, if you look at the fate of uh, uh, the 74 election, uh, the, the most determinative uh, actions happened in August and September of 1974 with the resignation of Nixon and then Ford's pardon of Nixon uh, in September. Uh, so if I, if I were to judge now, I'd say probably not in 2022, but where I think the Republicans will really pay the consequences in the, is in the presidential election of 2024. I mean, the circumstances today are a lot different uh, than they were in 1974. Let me just give you three that I think uh, make it very clear. First of all, in 1974, we were dealing with an incumbent president. Uh, Nixon had the reins of power in his hands, and it was getting increasingly clear as we went into the summer of 1974 that he was unable to really manage the country and that he was really unraveling in the White House. Uh, uh, Trump may be unraveling, but he's a private citizen now, and the, and the voters have already made their, uh, rendered their verdict on him and sent him home to uh, Florida. Uh, second, in 1974, we basically operated out of one set of facts. We had three television networks. They told the same story. We had Walter Cronkite. Uh, most people uh, uh, got their news from uh, the Associated Press or United Press International. Uh, it, it just, the, today it's so much different. Uh, but what one set of facts allows to happen is that the country can, can rally around uh, and, and come together because they're all believing the same, uh, their beliefs are on the same base, basis. Uh, and third, and maybe most important for the midterms, is the Republicans were the party in power. Uh, and the in-party and off-year elections always gets clobbered. We've talked about that all last year. Uh, and so not only did they have to deal with the Watergate scandal, but they also had to deal with high inflation. Uh, they had to deal with the Arab oil embargo and everything else that made voters unhappy. Uh, you know, and after the Ford's pardon of, uh, of Nixon, his approval rating, which is always an indicator of the direction the off years are going to go, dropped from 71 percent to 50 percent. Uh, you know, now now maybe my memory distorts things a little bit because, you know, certain things remain in your mind because they're historical and others that drop because they're sort of the issues of the day. But I think because of those three factors, uh, the 
Watergate was much more central to the debate than January 6th is. I mean, I think for most Americans, January 6th doesn't even come into a top five of concerns. They're concerned about COVID and about their lives being disrupt, uh, disrupted, about whether they can send their kids to school, about inflation, about crime. They, they go, the list goes on and on. And then maybe at the very end, you know, they'd like to see something done to, or, or they think about uh, January 6th. But now that's not the case with, uh, with the chattering class, uh, uh, sort of the elites who talk about it every day and focus on what the committee is doing. And to me, of course, that's very important. Uh, but so I think to have a real impact on the, uh, on the midterms, you're going to have to have a traumatic event like a president, you know, the equivalent of the Nixon resignation. Uh, and uh, uh, the so and the hearings may help on that. But unless there's something that just knocks the country on its rear end, uh, I just don't see it having uh, a great impact. Now, Biden <clears throat> made a good start this morning. He gave a very good speech where he, he sort of framed this as uh, what kind of country do we want to be? And I think that's the right tone for him to take. Uh, and uh, but he can't it can't be a one off. It can't be one speech and then go back to business as usual and go up there and yell for build back better and everything else. Uh, I mean, to uh, change the outcome of the elections, I think COVID has to be under control. I think inflation has to be going down. I think crime needs to be at least neutralized. The schools need to be open. All the things that affect everybody's everyday life. Now, I've talked about this before and very quickly. I mean, I, if I were the president to try to help achieve those things, uh, covid you know, just I'd, I'd go really hard on vaccinations, but I'd, I'd come back with a voting rights bill that drops all the things that can be interpreted as giving uh, the Democrats partisan advantage that deals with the real threats of undermining the electoral, the counting of elect, uh, uh, votes, of uh, uh, allowing legislatures to change the outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> I, I would pull Bo back better in a minute and say, We'll come, we'll come back with a lot of these things later, but we're going to do pre-K now because that's very important. Uh, and uh, I'd come up with a police initiative that had both more police and better training. And, and to get more police, it had to be contingent on better training and community initiatives. Uh, and uh, uh, then I think uh, I would hope that the hearings would focus uh, on exactly what's happening, who's responsible, but try not to, but try to avoid becoming a partisan uh, minefield. Uh, you know, in that case, maybe there'd be a change chance, uh, <clears throat> but uh, until all that happens, I just don't think the country's going to focus on the question Biden raised this morning. Greg, what are your uh, thoughts on all that? I, I see it. A little differently. I, I I like the reference to Walter Cronkite because I too was reflecting on Walter Cronkite and the way he closed off every uh, news broadcast was with uh, the phrase, and that's the way it is. And, and I thought to myself, boy, you know, we sure don't have somebody you know, who can maintain that kind of level of credibility today. I do think that Biden's speech today, however, went in that direction. I thought the, the, the speech was a strong speech. I thought his tone was right. But more than anything else, I think he raised the level of the discussion to the point where Republicans really have to do some soul searching. Because to stay with this message that some, and not all for sure, but some of them have, that this really wasn't an uprising that these uh, protesters stayed within the rope lines in the Great Hall, which is absurd. I mean, comments that, that just, you know, are on the face of it, totally false. To stay with that, what Biden did today was to say, you know, you, you've got uh, a dagger at the throat of democracy and I won't tolerate it. And, and they're going to, I think, have to answer to that. I, I do agree that in November, in the fall of this year, fall of 2022, Voters are going to the polls, probably not with January 6th, all that much on their mind. 
But in some ways, this discussion now occurs almost at the perfect time for Biden because he can't beat COVID. He can't get the money out fast enough in the next few months. He can't pass Build Back Better. I agree. I think Al's right. If he narrows the focus somewhat, he can get measures passed, but that's going to take weeks or months. But for now, uh, at least at least in the next few days, Biden, I think, has uh, delivered a, a stronger message than we've seen in a long time. And he's causing people to think about, you know, who we are, who we want to be. And I think he's going to give a great deal of um, fortitude to those Republicans who are already drifting away from Trump. And and I would say this, if if in fact that this speech in the next few days serve to further diminish Trump, it really does leave the Republican Party in a in a real bind because uh, Trump is a controlling figure in the Republican Party. There's no two ways about it. But I do think it's time for some some real soul searching. I do think the stakes have been raised today, um, and I, and I think that people are simply going to be less tolerant of those who decide to you know turn to violent protests in order to and, 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 and offer themselves up as, as a threat to democracy. Uh, I hope it doesn't happen. By the way, I think if it does happen, law enforcement will be, let's just say robust in their in their response. I just I don't I can't imagine a government building being overrun in the course of the next year if if that's tried. Uh, I think it'll get put down fairly quickly. And I think I think the other thing Biden has going for him, aside from those terrible visuals, is the facts are on his side. We're simply going to learn more. We're already learning that the people around Trump were clearly involved in the planning of January 6th. They were talking among themselves. They were talking to reporters. They were talking to the White House chief of staff in advance of January 6th about what was going to take place. And, you know, the facts uh, have a way of coming out. And I suspect, again, over this period of time, next couple of months, the more we learn, the worse it's going to look for Trump and those who support him. So I, I as a Republican, I hope there, this is a clarion call to Republicans to rethink if they're if they tend to support, be supportive of Trump, to rethink where they are, because I think this will be bad for the party. And to go back to your question, it will have consequences, uh, whether voters go to the polls with this uppermost in their mind or not. It will have consequences in terms of how Republican candidates are defined across the land later this year. You know, I think uh, uh, that uh, one thing to, to uh, that we we probably ought to focus on is uh, the next three or four months are really going to be critical in a sense because it's primary season, and uh, you know Trump's power is in primaries; it's not in a general election. Uh, he's a big loser in general elections, lost twice in the last time by over 7 million votes. Uh, and the voters that are going to probably decide the Congress are the college-educated voters in, in, in swing suburban districts. And that's the one voting block that I think uh, uh, this issue could have an impact on. Uh, but as I said, I think it, it because reaction to Trump is very different. Uh, by in a primary electorate than in a general electorate. And uh, we'll see. I mean, what could happen, uh, you know, one thing that could happen is that a bunch of Trump's now uh, uh, endorsed, I think, 40 candidates and about half of them are vengeance endorsements, people who who, uh, spoke out against him. Now, if a lot of those people win their primaries, and, but are unacceptable. And if they're in swing districts, I mean, usually he endorses honestly in, in safe Republican districts so he can claim he wins. But uh, but if there are enough of them in swing districts, maybe that'll make a difference. Uh, but uh, I think just the fact that he's, he's sort of gone and uh, it'll be a big thing in the Republican primaries. But after that, we'll see uh, uh, how big of an issue it is as we get into a general election. Greg, you have the last word this week. Well, I think the, the, those points are important. I, you know, you ask about in the beginning the contrast with Watergate, the, and Al's quite right. The huge difference here is you don't have a, a sitting president at the heart of, the, of this controversy. You have a defeated former president, as Biden kept referring to him today. Um, 
And, and so he doesn't have everything that goes with that office at his command. He canceled his press conference today or whatever he was going to do today because he couldn't get the networks to cover his speech. He's got a rally this weekend. We'll see, so he's promising a packed crowd in Arizona. We'll see how that goes. But I, I, I'm consistently of the belief that time is not in his favor. He no longer has the powers of the presidency. He no longer has Air Force One. He can show up. He can motivate those people uh, who choose to support him. But I, I really do believe that will be a declining uh, voice, not only within the Republican Party, but certainly within the nation. And I think the general election, by the time we get to that stage, if Biden has been successful in any of these areas that Al has laid out, um, I, I, I just can't see people turning to Trump or whatever Trump's philosophy is as a path forward. At least that's my hope for 2022. Well, that's the way it is. Uh, Al Fromm, Craig Fuller, thanks so much. We'll see you next week.